But I want to just simply bring us back to, you know, the Christian has every reason to, to be joyful, right? Let alone this season, but to be joyful in, in what this truly means. I mean, I realize Jesus didn't tell us to remember his birth, right? But it's vitally important that he comes, that he's born, and the, and the, the gospels clearly teach us this, and he came in such a way that he was sinless, which is vital, uh, I love telling the youth, I've asked these questions a few times now, they just know it and, and, and answer quickly, but I always ask them, can, can someone who has sin redeem us? Can another human step into your place and redeem you? And of course, they're like, no, it has to be someone who is sinless. And this is what the season is about. It's the object, right, of our joy. It is Christ. And this morning, uh, you know, last week we looked at the joy, Psalm 98. This morning I want to look at Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 35. And what I'm simply calling hope revealed, right, is the revealing. And uh, we see this in Joseph and Mary, their obedience, going to the temple and bringing Jesus after he was born. And we see this character, Simeon, who was there and waiting and full of the Holy Spirit. But there's some things that are communicated about who Christ is. And I think that will encourage us, remind us, we have a real hope. It's not a, a fleeting hope. It's not a hope that the world has produced. It is a hope that comes from God. I think this is another reason, not, not simply that we should be joyful, you know, like run around with a smile on our face and giddy all the time. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, I, I realize that sometimes joy is, is, comes with tears, Right? Sometimes we, grow, we through, go through hardship. We go through difficulties. We're not promised the easy life. But despite the situation, there is a constant, which is Christ. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. He doesn't give in or give up on you. He doesn't take coffee breaks, right? There's never a moment when his eye isn't upon you. That's who he is. And like the joy we have, we also have a real hope. And I think hope really sets a tone. It should be evident in us that we live our lives in such a way that it exudes from us. I have a real hope. I was reminded a few uh, weeks ago, I was listening to the radio of this story, and I just wanted to share it. I've, I've heard it before, and it's a great encouragement to hope. It's a story about a school system that had this program. When a child would go into the hospital and there was a lengthy time that they were going to be in the hospital, this program the school had set up was to have uh, other teachers. They were tasked to go to, to the hospitals and, and work with the students so they wouldn't get behind. And so this one teacher who, was, who had done this many times was tasked to go to this one hospital, and she was told by the, the student's teacher, hey, we're working on nouns and adverbs, and we don't want uh, this child to get behind. Would you please go and do this? Absolutely, no problem. I've done this before. Well, she gets to the hospital, and, and no one had prepared her for what she was going to see. The child she was going to go and, and teach nouns and adverbs who had been severely burned. She so kind of caught herself, kind of gasping a little bit. It's the scene she came into and just the, the, the hopelessness she felt. She explained to the child who she was and why she was there and began her, her lesson. She felt like she just kind of stampered through it. Didn't really communicate nouns and adverbs as well, but she just thought, well, I got through it. She left that day and went home and prepared herself for the following day or the next time she was to go and to, to teach this child. So she gets to the hospital the following day and is heading up to the room and she is met by the nurse outside the door and the nurse asks her, what did you do? And feeling this weight of like, I don't know what I did, she starts to apologize. I'm sorry. And the nurse completely cuts her off and says, no, you don't understand. The child now is responding. He is immensely encouraged. It's almost as if he wants to live. And the teacher has no response. I don't know. I covered nouns and adverbs, right? I don't know what I did. And this goes on for a few weeks, and the child's improvement continues to grow. And finally, after a couple of weeks, he's able to express what the change was. And he says it like this. As he's telling about the change, he expressed it like this. He says, they wouldn't send a teacher to work on nouns and adverbs with a dying boy, would they? 
they wouldn't send a teacher to work on. on Can you imagine the boy sitting there? Here's a teacher trying to make sure he doesn't fall behind, and it's nouns and adverb. There's this moment of hope. Right? How much more? Right In our lives, and we experience highs, lows, we go through moments, and I'm sure you've experienced where the question is, Lord, not, not what are you doing, but where are you? You seem so removed. You seem so far away. I think this morning, this little passage, as the Lord, as Luke unfolds it through the Holy Spirit, he's writing for us, gives us profound encouragement. We have a real hope, not a fleeting hope, it's not a hope rooted in you know, nouns and adverbs. Well, that's important, right? But it's a hope in Christ and his coming. So Luke says it like this. This is chapter 2, verses 25 through 35. It says, And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And his father and mother were amazed the things which were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, This child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end, excuse me, to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Let me offer a brief prayer. Father, we thank you for this time you've given to us. We ask that your spirit would now be with us, God teaching us and instructing us, Lord, that we would not leave this place the same, but have a stronger confidence in who you are, what Christ has done. And I pray, as always, get me out of the way, Lord, that every soul will be fixed upon you, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's the scene that we have this morning, right? Jesus has been born, and we have the parents simply acting in obedience. They're going through and fulfilling what was required of the law. And they're coming to the temple. And in the temple, there is this man who is just sitting there hanging out, waiting to see the Messiah. Joseph and Mary are just simply coming. They want to dedicate Jesus officially to the Lord. They want to fulfill the regulations that we see in Leviticus. Um, and, and here's the, the context of the passage. You know, they don't have... Uh, the requirement of a lamb, but the law gave an exception that they could offer. If you could not afford a lamb, you could offer two turtle doves or two young pigeons, right? And so one was offered, one pigeon was offered as a burnt offering and one for a sin offering. But isn't it interesting that this picture, here we are, just these, these, these two young couple holding Jesus, not having a lamb, right, to pay for the sacrifice, and yet they're holding the lamb of the world, so this is the scene. So two young parents, all the things that have been said about Jesus, all the things that are running through their minds, they come to this moment and they run into Simeon in the temple, right? That's what's happening. And the first thing, it leads to kind of my first point as we talk about this hope revealed, is as hope in Christ is my point. Hope in Christ anticipates God's faithfulness. I mean, this is what is communicated, right? And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout. He was looking for the consolation of Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him. Here's what we learn about this man. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he had came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law. Here's the context, right? We see 
Uh, Simeon being faithful, trusting in who God is and his faithfulness. You know, the idea of faithfulness uh, contains the idea of stability, firmness, right? He is living in a way that is trust in who God is. I mean, that's kind of what we know. We don't know a lot about Simeon. We know he's, he's a man in Jerusalem. Some think he was, he was a priest, but the Bible does not say that specifically. We see that he's simply there waiting. He's full of the Holy Spirit, and he's waiting to see the Messiah. So what does that show us? What does that instruct us with? I think here is that Christians, right, as we look upon Simeon who is simply waiting, anticipating, full of the Holy Spirit, he has a a hopeful disposition, right? This should mark who we are. This should be something that is evident in us. I know we go through hardships. I know at times it's difficult. I know there's moments in your life where you go, I wish I didn't get up today, but this is what went on. I understand that. I, like you, am human. But we should. What carries the day is this idea of having a hopeful disposition. That despite the situation, despite what you're going through, you have a confidence down deep inside of you that says, I know my Savior lives. I know where this is heading. I've read the end of the book. I know. Luke tells us about Simeon that he was just and devout. Right? These, are, these are two good words, and they must work together. We see that not only is Simeon uh, devout towards God, although we, we mark this character in his life, Luke tells us he's righteous. His interactions with others is characterized by this. Just and devout have to go together. I don't know if you've ever met a person who is, uh, there's the saying, so heavenly-minded, they're no earthly good. Right? They're so devout, but their life doesn't quite mirror. It doesn't really work itself out into their daily life. Well, the opposite is also true of that, right? We can be so earthly minded, there's no heavenly good in us whatsoever. But they must work together, right? You must have uh, righteousness and devout, right? They work together in the sense of who you are. I mean, this is a character trait of Simeon. We're simply saying he's marked by the full of the Holy Spirit, and it's evident in his life. He's living the life. He has a hopeful disposition that he is going to come to the temple. He is going to hold the Savior. His focus is upon the Lord. So the question of simple application for us today is, where is your thought life? What are the things that are important to you? Are they evident in your life? Are, are you seeing the, the working together of your love for Christ and your worship on Sunday? Does it manifest itself? Do you have a hopeful disposition on Monday, on Tuesday, the rest of the week? It doesn't mean that we're perfect. Sometimes we look at that and go, well, shoot, I've, I've blown it already. Well, it means direction, right? The life of the Christian is full of repentance and moving forward, it's not perfection, it is direction. We, I say these things all the time. I'm going to coin some of them. I'm sure you'll get sick of them, but I like the ones that justification leads to what? It leads to sanctification. Even though sanctification happens at the same time of salvation, there is evidence, right, of growing in holiness. This is also a part of our assurance. I've said it also like this, that theology leads to doxology, right? Your understanding of who God is affects your life. It leads to worship. I've also said it like this, what's important to you gets done. There's the practical rubber meets the road one, right? And so we see this in his life, right? Simeon cannot hide who he is. That's the point. A hopeful disposition should be evident in us. There's that saying, I know you've heard this before. If you sow a thought, you reap an act, right? As it, as it cascades from there, sow an act, you reap a habit and so forth. Where is your thinking? You know, what is, what is your thinking regarding, right, the situation you're walking through this morning? Is it one of hopelessness? Are you anticipating that even in this, God has a purpose? We read this psalm, right? The psalmist speaks of God decreeing. God is sovereign. And yet he operates with your volition, right? He's not absent, for he would cease to be God. So this should be developing in us. We also see that as he says, uh, or I put in your notes, uh, Christians are to have a hopeful dedication, right? He's looking. He's purposely doing something. I'm, I'm coming to the temple and I'm looking. He's waiting. 
I, waiting for me and patience to me, I don't know about you, um, they're hard, right? To me, sometimes I refer to patience as a dirty word. We just don't use that word, right? It's really tough to do, and it's hard to read James when he tells you to be patient. Well, that's something that's, that's right, difficult to do, and, and I see this in, in his own life, but you see the dedication is that he's coming. We're, we're, we kind of have this idea that he comes once, and it's just like, hey, this one time uh, he shows up, and there is uh, Joseph and Mary, and, and guess what? They're holding uh, the, the Messiah. I don't, I don't think it played out quite like that. I, I'd imagine that there's many times that he's gone to the temple, and I would imagine that he's probably interacted with the priest there who's saying, why, why are you here, Simeon? And, and he said, I'm waiting on the Lord's Messiah. Now, to this point, there has been nothing, right? 400 years from, from Malachi, the end of the, of the Old Testament, to this moment, there's been nothing. So if he's interacting with humans, which he is, and he's coming continually, which I think is coming to the temple, you can imagine the reaction of the priest, Right? I, I would love to, if I could, you know, the eye rolling. Can you imagine? Oh, I'm waiting for the Messiah. Again. You can just imagine. Now, the scripture doesn't say that, but we, we know how humans, are you really? Okay, great. Good luck with that. Right? It would be something we might hear. But he is dedicated. He is waiting. You know, I, I think the things we, we go through in life, the Lord doesn't always just miraculously change things, does he? I mean, sometimes we'd always want to say that that's not the case, but he, he moves in his own time, in his own way, because part of the process is he is shaping you. You know, part of the waiting is us. It's never on, on God's side in the sense that he's unable or heartless, right, as sometimes we may think. But he's shaping you. He's developing this dedication in you. This is true to scripture. I cite this passage often, right? Romans 8, 20 and 29 is shaping into the image of his son. And sometimes we go through these experiences where we just want to hit the, the ejection button and let's get out of this. And I don't want to go through this, but yet the Lord is shaping you. So we see this pattern in his life. He's waiting on the Messiah. He is being obedient. Now he's full of the Holy Spirit. Luke tells us that and the Spirit has revealed to him that he will in fact see the Messiah before he dies, right? I mean, he has these things working with him. And today, if you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, you also are full of the Holy Spirit. It's the blessing of Pentecost. We too, like Simeon, can wait upon the Lord with confidence, with a holy and, and uh, uh, hoping disposition, right, upon who he is and what he's capable of doing. Sometimes when the answer doesn't come right away, because let's face it, we're a microwave society, right? And, and I've mentioned this before. Sometimes if I have to reheat another 30 seconds to heat up something, it's just like, oh my goodness, right? Some of you have had, had that moment. I've got to go another 30 seconds. We want it right now, but this is the, the idea of a hopeful disposition, right? Is, is realizing and it's anticipating, Right? There is a genuine hope, and we live, you know, this moment has happened. Christ has come. He's gone to the cross. He has been uh, risen from the grave, and we are the, the already but the not yet of the kingdom, and we look back on this moment, and so we're grabbing these insights and saying, what does that mean for my life today is that I, too, just like Simeon, can wait. I can trust. I can believe, and I should have this in me. We see it marked in his life. You know, sometimes, by, by way of a warning, we look at these things, these situations of life, and we kind of reason in a wrong direction. We kind of conclude, well, maybe I, I, I don't really know God, or God doesn't care, or he's got other things that are more important. It reminds me of this story of a man by the name of Carl Rogers. He was a psychologist. And when he was 22 years old, he goes off to seminary, Union Theological Seminary in New York. This is back in 1924. And while there, he participated in a seminar organized to explore religious doubts. Rogers later said of the group, the majority of the members, in thinking their way through questions they had raised, thought themselves right out of religious work which he says, I was one. See, the, the problem is we come to these moments in life 
and we simply go, you know what, I'm not going to no longer trust the Lord. We wouldn't say that, but this is kind of our reasoning. I'm not going to trust, and I'm not going to wait, because he, he should have moved already. So therefore, I'm going to reason this direction, and pretty soon we go, you know what, I'll just take matters into my own hands. This is why we must stand. Hope anticipates. It means we continue to pray. We continue to call on our brothers and sisters to say, walk with me through this. Like we see this in his life. This is something that we have. He's waiting upon the Lord. We see the second thing, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He has the influence of the Spirit. What does the Spirit do? Jesus tells us the Spirit isn't going to speak of himself. The Spirit won't lead you away from Scripture or lead you into some other direction. The Spirit is going to communicate Christ. Right? So if you're in a place or a location where Christ is not preached, you can be pretty sure the Spirit isn't working. He uses Scripture, right? He brings that. It is by God's Word we come to faith. This is what the Holy Spirit uses, and He is going to glorify Christ. You today, as we're full of the Holy Spirit, can be encouraged. This is, this is the joy we have, just like Simeon. We're full of the Holy Spirit. He is our help, our comfort. Call upon Him. Lean upon Him. Trust in Him. He's also right filled with a promise. Holy Spirit is impressed upon Simeon that you, before you die, you're going to see the Lord's Messiah. Imagine that moment. Here he is waiting, anticipating. He's not wavering. It's not just the, hey, all of a sudden the Spirit showed up, and guess what? It's going to work like a, like a, a microwave should. It's just going to be two minutes, and you're going to see it. It's all taken care of. No, this unfolds over time. It anticipates that the hope is genuine. It's real. And we see it in his life. He's trusting in God's faithfulness. He he's anticipates God is going to be faithful because he's been faithful in the past. He will be faithful today. This leads to the second point. Hope in Christ embraces, right? God's goodness. Of course it does. Listen to verses 28 through 32. He says, Then he took him in his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Here is the goodness of God, right? You cannot have goodness without God, and you cannot have God without goodness, right? When we are in Christ, we have the goodness. This is one of his attributes, it's not as if God is good today and tomorrow it's 50-50, right? To see, it depends how he wakes up. He might be a little irritable. It doesn't work like that with God. You and I may operate that way, right? <clears throat> used to have this joke with my roommates at Bible college. I said, you know what? Hey, in the first few morning, you know, moments of the morning, especially if I haven't had coffee, just be careful. I may not treat you like a Christian, right? <laughs> used to be our joke. I'm saved. It's okay, but it just might be a little irritable, Right? God isn't like that. He is eternally good. He's unchangeably good. He is infinitely good. This is his character. This is why we can say with confidence that in our, in our lives, in the moments, right, that, that we think, well, God has departed. No, he is good. You might be going through a situation or experiencing something, but guess, guess what? He is good. He is walking you. He doesn't depart or give up. He is constantly good. The Psalm, Psalm 34, 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. We saw in our psalm reading this morning, Psalm 2, right? How blessed are the ones who find refuge in Christ. What a wonderful blessing that we have. So God's goodness is with us. We have this confidence, right? So we embrace it. So we see that hope embraces God's fulfillment. God has a plan. God has a purpose. Isn't it comforting to know that God isn't going, well, um, I guess we'll do this now, right? Well, I guess so we'll do this now. No, he has a plan. Isn't it amazing that in God's sovereignty and his decreeing, he works it with your own volition and your decision-making? There's great mystery there, but the Lord works through these, and the Bible communicates both of these, that you can be operating and making decisions, and God is also fulfilling his purpose and his plan in your life. How he does that? Yeah, I don't know, right? He's God. But what's amazing is in this passage, Luke uses a word here for Lord. Usually it's the word kurios, which we see in the Greek, right? We see it unfolding. He doesn't use that word. He uses the word despotes, 
It's another Greek word for, for God, but it, it has this idea ever more so, not just Lord, but that he has absolute power over someone. So when Simeon says these words, if you were to translate this verse, verse 29, he was saying, now, master, you are releasing your slave in peace. This is what Simeon is communicating and saying in this moment, that he's holding the Messiah. And as he's holding this, this is his moment of saying, you, God, you master over me. Uh, you are the divine uh, authority over my life. You have brought me to this place. You have fulfilled what you have said, and your slave now can depart in peace. So we see this relationship, right? Simeon has this idea that, that he is just uh, lower than a servant, we would say. He was using the word slave, doulos. And he uses master and lord, excuse me, lord as, as absolute power, absolute authority over him. See, today that kind of idea has negative connotation, right? The, the idea of someone lording over us or, or being lord over us, we don't necessarily like that. We don't like the idea of someone ruling over us by brute force or tyranny, right? We see these things, unfortunately, in our, our government doing certain things. And we don't like that. But here in a biblical context, it is the right relationship. Simeon is simply saying, my allegiance is completely to you. My submission is to your authority. You are master owner. That's true to scripture. Paul has told us that we are bought at a price. We are not our own. He has purchased us. And yet the amazing grace of God, he says, you're not simply slaves, right? A slave or a servant, as it's translated, doesn't know the father's plans, but I have called you friend. Even in the relationship, Jesus, right, comforts us. So we see that there is the hope of fulfillment. We look to this and say, look, he is coming. He's going to fulfill this. Uh, he is holding the Messiah. And these are the words coming out. Can you imagine yourself in this situation? You've been waiting on the Lord, and, and the Lord finally has moved in this uh, miraculous way, and you're just standing there. Are these the words that come out of your mouth? Father, you have blessed me yet again. You've blessed your slave. You've blessed your servant. Is that where you rest? Simeon has this confidence. It leads, I believe, to assurance. What I put in your notes, right? Hope embraces God's assurance. Listen to these words. He says, your salvation, right? In verse 31, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles. Now, here's a rhetorical question. Who are the Gentiles? It's us. Here is salvation. Here is his answer to our sin problem. It's not a human act, right? It is God's act. So now Paul says this in Romans 3, 21 through 26. I love this. He says, but now apart from the law, uh, excuse me, the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. How does God make us just? Does he make you righteous? No. He imputes to us the moment of salvation, the perfect righteousness of Christ. So that God simply can say, and true to word, right, he is just and the justifier. See, God demands perfection, and you and I are born into sin. Yet God has answered this. God has dealt with this. This leads, right, to assurance that Christ has sufficiently done salvation, completed it for us. It is Israel's hope. It is our hope this morning. We are the Gentiles. That's why Paul can also say in Romans early, in Romans 1.16, where I'm not ashamed of the gospel. 
For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first, also to the Greek. This is the assurance. This is what he's saying. He's acknowledging who Christ is. <clears throat> Isn't it wonderful this morning that you can have this hope? With all the ups and downs of life and the situations the Lord walks us through, that we can continually have this hope. Reminds me of a story of two Christian friends who were together coming to the end of their lives. And one says to his friend, I fear you are near another world. His friend says, I know. And he says it cheerfully. He says, but blessed be the name of the Lord. I do not fear it. I hope for it. What a radical different paradigm in which the Christian operates. In the midst of difficulty. Are you going through something difficult today? Is this season just difficult? Are you going through maybe doubts? Maybe you're in this position where you're trying to think through this whole religious thing. Is, this, is Christianity really true? It's true. He came, he lived, he died, he rose. These are facts. This is the, the hope that we have. We have it in God's faithfulness. We see it in God's goodness. And my last point here this morning. Hope in Christ proclaims God's justice. 33 through 35, and, and again, he's speaking to them, and he says, And his father and mother were amazed, the things they were, which they were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel, and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even his, your, own, your own soul. To the end, that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. I think it's very interesting that he turns to mom here, doesn't he? Hey, mom, this is going to pierce your soul. You're going to see things. This is where Christ, your son, Jesus, is going. So just as Simeon is proclaiming, right, this is the future. Here is the proclamation, fulfilling scripture. This is where he's going. He's going to be appointed for the, the fall and rise of many in Israel. And we understand that today, not just Israel, but globally. Today we proclaim, just like Simeon, right, uh, what future looks like, those who are in Christ and those without Christ, right? In Christ, you have a hope, an eternal hope with God that lasts forever. God will always love, God the Father will always love God the Son. He will always love those whom the Son has redeemed. It's, uh, it's, it's a love that is eternal, unchangeable, it's infinite, right? It never ends, because otherwise it would go contrary to who God is. The opposite is also true. The Lord says, I will pour out my wrath upon those who are not in God. He is true to that statement. Those who are not repentant of their sins, this is the eternity. We have this message. It's typically not around Christmas, is it, right? We think about, oh, well, let's just do these nice things and put on some nice music. But this is the reality of it. Why has Christ come? What is he actually dealing with? He's dealing with our sin problem because there's no other way around it. You and I didn't choose our sin problem. We were born into this. There's nothing here. There's no work on this planet that you can do that fixes this problem. You cannot become perfect. Christ is necessary. And why is he here? And why will he go to the point where he dies on a cross? Why will he go through this? Because you and I are sinners and this is the only way he redeems us. And this is our message. This is the gospel. That one day in your life, you will stand before a holy God and you will give an account. And on that moment, you're either going to say, it is Christ and him alone. There is no other. Or are you going to say, you know what? I think I'm pretty good in my own. That's it. To which that standard, I will say, if that's what you're trusting in your own works, will fall miserably short. And he will say, depart, I never knew you. How sad it might be on that day if you think of Matthew 7, of those who, who profess to know Christ, and to hear from Jesus, depart from me. This is why we must understand the gospel. You must understand justification. How does it work? This is what God is doing. Simeon is holding, right, the Savior who's going to go to that cross on Calvary. And at that moment, he is going to pay for the sins of all those who repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And God will be satisfied. Wrath will be appeased. It's going to be poured out on him 
and not those in Jesus. Listen to it. Isaiah 53, 11 says, as a result of the anguish of his soul, speaking of Christ, he will see it, God the Father will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. In the middle of the Christmas season, what do we see? We see, right, the answer to our sin problem. God has dealt with it. Why do we have every reason to shout and to sing? It's because Christ has truly come. God doesn't owe you. He doesn't owe me anything. But yet his love and his character is to to redeem those who repent. What an awesome God. I know we go through hardships, brothers and sisters. I know we go through difficult things. But this is the hope, right? This is the realization that we can anticipate this just like Simeon. We can embrace this just like Simeon. We can proclaim this just like Simeon. The parents, right, Joseph and Mary, I mean, all the things that have gone on, if you're familiar with the story, right, at the birth of Jesus, how many things that have just blown their minds. I'm surprised they're still functioning really at this point, but, right, there's just everything that's going on, angels showing up, this miraculous birth, all these things. There's shepherds and angels. I mean, come on. Then they get here, and once again, they're amazed. They're amazed. She speaks, right? He speaks to mom. Mom, this child is going to Calvary. He will be the cause of the fall and the rise of many. He is the reason. So in your notes, I put simply two things. Christ is the chief cornerstone. He's it. There's nothing the world can produce. There's nothing that you can cling to here. There's nothing that you can cling to in your own self. I know it's a strange way to save the world, but this is necessary. Even while holding this little baby, this is necessary. We also see that there will be a reaction to Christ. Just as those who are in have this hope and this confidence, right? We will rise with him. I know that if, if, if I don't wake tomorrow, I will be, right, in glory with the Lord. I have that confidence. And, and if he gives me breath tomorrow, we'll keep praising him and seeking him and going, right? That's, that's where we're at as, as followers of Jesus Christ. But those who are not in Christ, Christ will become the stumbling block. There's no neutrality with God, right? There's no gray area. There's no like, hey, I can get in on a loophole. I know I make that joke. If, you know, if they let so-and-so in, I'm guaranteed, right? Because you, you let him in. and It's not like that. See, your name, not your parents' name, not your grandparents' name, not some lineage, your name has to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. See, people will look at the cross today, and this is true of of this moment in history and of, of today, people will look upon the cross and they will, they will see someone telling them how to live, right? Don't want anything to do with that. I choose my own life. Today, it's very popular, right, to simply rebel and I will tell God what sex I am and what my, my life will be. I, I will, right, will have this whole rebellion, I'm not going to submit my life to, to God who says he only committed, committed, or excuse me, created male and female. I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you who I am. It's completely upside down. Going back to the passage we read, what, is, what does the Lord do? What does the psalmist say? He, he laughs. And those who would shake their fist at God, we're going to cast this off. Peter says in Peter, 1 Peter 2.8, he says, the press, speaking of Christ, this precious value then is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. And to this doom, they were also appointed I mean, Peter summarizes that, doesn't he? Christ is an offense to people. 
religion. Jesus, he offends me. How dare you say there's only one way? How dare Christ say there's only one way? I can't follow that because that offends me. Paul says it like this, 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is the power of God. So this morning, simply ask these questions. You know, are you going without hope, without real hope? Is Christ the cornerstone or are you stumbling over him? You're stumbling over him. Today needs to be a day where you confess, repent, believe. Be in a position where you can anticipate Right, rightly in the current situation, in the current moment, you can anticipate not only that, the future anticipation of God's faithfulness. He's going to keep and fulfill Scripture. He's going to do these things. We can embrace today God's goodness, right? That He has provided a Savior. That Simeon is simply holding the Messiah, and He's proclaiming these things. We too can proclaim this message. Have it in our hearts. What is Christmas about? When those moments come when people ask you, why do you go to church? Well, let me tell you why. Why do you read the Bible? Let me me explain to you what God has done. Why do you do such things? What is different about you? Simply say, here it is. Let me proclaim to you the true message of Christmas. It changed my life and it can change yours too. See, this is the difference. This is the difference that we have. Different than the world. This is the hope that changes everything. Just like the child at the beginning. God has sent his son. He didn't come to teach us nouns and adverbs, although they're important. But he has redeemed us. This is the hope we have. We're going to close here in, in just a moment of pray. And we're going to close by singing uh, that, the carol, What Child Is This? And I just want to encourage you, and it seems like it fits kind of this element of, of life, right? It begins with this minor key, and the verses are in the minor. What child is this that laid to rest? And as it goes to the chorus, it, it goes to like the major key, right? It begins to go from the A minor to the G. It just moves that way. See, sometimes in life, when we look upon the situation, it's like this minor chord, and minor chords are always depressing, right? You can tell the difference between a minor chord and a major. It's depressing. You know, it's gloomy outside. Ah, it's depressing. But the major lifts our eyes and we begin to smile. And the, the carol is written that way. Sometimes life is this, but this. This is Christ. This is the king. Angels sing about him. We proclaim this is who you have. This is who I have. And all those in Christ. Be encouraged. Let's pray. Lord, thank you the truth of your word, the truth of of this season, what it means. Thank you, Lord, that we can have hope, real hope, a hope that the world doesn't produce, the world cannot know it, only those in Christ. And so, Father, I pray this morning for every soul here that, Lord, our, our desire would be you. And if we're going without hope, Lord, that you, by your spirit, would, would reveal that to us. You would open our eyes. Lord, be, Lord, please be merciful to us. Open our eyes and allow the truth of this word to rest in our hearts. Let not the, the evil one take it. But let it grow deep in us. Lord, that we would have a hopeful disposition, a dedication to you. That we would live a life anticipating. You are God. You have, you have brought this to pass. You will bring all the promises to pass. And so, Lord, I I ask that you would give us, by your spirit, that disposition, that anticipation. I pray that you would remind us, Lord, and keep it in front of us, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us also realize, Lord, to what lengths you have gone to love us and redeem us. Let us be encouraged by that. Let us sing, Lord, lift our voices in worship, not just on the Lord's day, but every day of the week. Help us in those moments of, of hardship. Lord, we go through difficulties. Some of us are going through difficulties today. I pray you would, by your Spirit, strengthen them and encourage them, Lord, with the real hope of your word, that we too, just like Simeon, who held Jesus, we can embrace 
the Savior. And he embraces, more importantly, embraces us. Oh, Lord, let us have that confidence. Lead us that way. I pray this all in the wonderful, beautiful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.